Hi, I'm Doug Reeves. Welcome to the webinar series on grading, standards, and assessment. I want to particularly thank Dr. Terry Hanrahan of Plano District 88 in Illinois for providing some really thoughtful questions that we can reflect together. I also want to invite you to participate directly with me. You can email at douglas.reeves at creativeleadership.net. You can tweet at Douglas Reeves, and I'll be happy to have conversations with you as well as with your faculty so that we can explore these issues in greater detail. So let's get to work. The first of these webinar series is about grading. What is the purpose of grading? I want to ask a more broad question, and that is, what is the purpose of feedback? Because grading is a form of feedback. And the fundamental purpose is to provide feedback to students so that they improve their performance, and teachers can also improve their performance. Now I know grades have a lot of other purposes in people's minds, and that is to evaluate students, to communicate with parents, and so on, and those are all fine purposes. But the number one purpose is to provide feedback to improve student performance and to improve teacher performance. And that is the filter that you want to apply to every grading policy that you have. So what are the common errors that are found throughout schools, not just in the U.S., but around the world? There are several things that I think we need to address, and that is, number one, the use of a zero on a hundred-point scale, and number two, the use of the average, number three, the interval between grading systems, and I'll address each one of those in turn. And I'll also suggest some options for improving grading practice. Let's first address the issue of the zero on a 100-point scale. I want you to think about this mathematically, and let's, let's for easy math assume that a 90 is an A, 80 is a B, 70 is a C, and 60 is a D. Now, what's the interval between A and B and C and D? It's 10 points. But let's assume that a student A does wretched work and gets a 60, and the other student doesn't turn anything in. What's their grade? A zero. That's six times worse, 60 points difference between wretched work at a D and not turning in work at zero. Now, I want to acknowledge that not turning work in is a bad thing. You want students to do the work. You want them to be personally responsible. The question is, is not turning work in really six times worse than a D? Moreover, I want to ask if the zero actually achieves what we want. I mean, you and I both believe in personal responsibility for kids. But does a zero really encourage personal responsibility, especially when we say no retakes, no late work? I've had kids who will say, give me the zero defiantly, because that means they really don't have to do the work. Now think about it. In the mind of a student, that no retake with a zero is not a punishment. It's a reward. They don't have to do the work. Let's think about a better consequence than a zero, and that is doing the work. While we're on the subject of the 100-point scale on the zero, let me also address one of the most common objections that we have to reforming that policy. What some school districts have done is to say, well, if a D is a 60, then not turning work in is a 50, so we preserve equal intervals. But the objection to that is, how can you possibly give somebody 50 points for doing nothing? I mean, after all, they say, if I didn't show up for work, would I still get 50% of my pay? So let's anticipate that objection and offer a practical improvement. You want to know what grading systems used to be before the advent of 100-point scales? It was 4, 3, 2, 1. A is a 4, B is a 3, C is a 2, D is a 1, F is a 0. And when you think about it, that's the way grade point averages are still calculated. Not a 100-point scale, but a 4, 3, 2, 1. So if you want a fast and clear way to improve the mathematical accuracy of your grading system, stop the 100-point scale and go to the old-fashioned grading system of A, B, C, D, F, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. That way, if students don't turn in work, you can still give a 0. But now it's a mathematically accurate zero, with one point between each grade. If you do that one thing, it will improve your failure rate and allow students to recover from a zero and still have an opportunity to pass the class, maybe even excel in it. The second big mistake in grading is the use of the average. And that means that if we use the average, students are being punished at the end of the term for their mistakes early in the term. Now, before I talk about students, 
let me respectfully talk about you. I'll bet a lot of viewers uh, already have achieved a master's degree. They all have taken classes in assessment, and if you had a graduate degree, you had to take classes in statistics and research. And I know a few of you found that to be your favorite class, but not many. You walked into my stat and research class saying, I can't remember algebra. How in the world am I going to do statistics? Why do I even need to do this when I'm an administrator or I'm teaching social studies or I'm teaching third grade? I don't need stat and research. And that's September. You hate it and you're not doing well. October. How can I possibly remember these things? It was 20 years since I had an algebra class. November. Well, I, I guess I'm starting to get it. He's not trying to make me into a propeller head like he is. He, he's just trying to help me understand statistics and research and be a better consumer. December. Now I get it. And you're really doing well. And then you're in my office explaining why I should not have the average between September and now I get it. And you're right. I shouldn't use the average. I should evaluate you at the now I get it stage. And if you think that that's appropriate for you, let me suggest that's also appropriate for your students. A lot of students come into the class early in the term and they just don't get it. They may not be motivated. They may be bewildered by the subject. But with your careful teaching and guidance, they work harder. They get it. And those zeros early in the semester become B's and A's late in the semester. Should you really average all of those terms, or should you evaluate students where they are at the end of the semester? Some of the best grading systems in the world that I've observed, and I've seen many of them, dismiss those early failures and focus on how students are doing at the end of the semester. That's what a grade ought to reflect, where a student is right now. So to review, let's get rid of the zero on a 100 point scale and go to a four, three, two, one, zero scale. Let's get rid of the average. And I know what you're thinking. Our computerized grading system makes us do that. No, it doesn't. Your professional judgment is far better than any computer's judgment. And so override those. Set the scale at four to zero. Abolish the use of the automatic default of the average and substitute your professional judgment. When I've had teachers say it's impossible, I've asked administrators, can we really change that? Unanimously, they say that they can. So, let's eliminate those toxic rating practices. Now, some other key topics that I want to address. How about retakes? A lot of people say, you know, in the real world, you got to get things done the first time. That may have been true in the 17th or 18th century. It's sure not too true in the 21st century. You want to know what the real world is? It's all about making a work product, getting feedback, improving it, resubmitting it, getting feedback, improving it, resubmitting it, getting feedback and improving it. That is the real world. And it's also the real world of a great school where your feedback leads to improved performance. Now, I'm not saying that retakes ought to be endless, but I am suggesting if you work so hard on giving feedback, your feedback should be respected. And that means when I get your feedback, including feedback that says, Doug, you failed this class or you failed this assessment or you didn't do the homework right, the appropriate response is doing it again. That conveys respect for your feedback and an opportunity to do things better. I'm not suggesting that this is endless. I know what you're thinking. Kids will just sandbag us and then submit all the work at the end. That's possible. But I think if we have incentives to do things right the first time, and if we have incentives to respect your feedback, you're not going to have things at the end of the semester. In fact, you'll have kids early on using your feedback to improve performance. Finally, let's talk about separating behavior from academic performance. I, I realize that in addition to academic standards, you have behavioral standards. You want kids, for example, to be respectful. You want them to show up on time. You want them to engage in class discussions. All of those things are good behavioral objectives. So don't think for a moment that I'm focusing just on academic standards and comparing students to the standard for a grade. I respect the fact that you want good behavior, that you want timely attendance, that you want engagement in class. In fact, I respect that so much that I think you should call good behavior behavior and don't call it algebra, don't call it social studies, don't call it English. That's why many schools have both an academic grade and a citizenship grade. If you really want better performance, don't 
confuse the academic feedback with behavioral feedback. Be really specific on what you expect, and it's okay to put those expectations in the report card, but list them separately from academic performance. So, grading is one of those things that if we get it right, it will support everything else that you do. But if we get grading wrong by the use of things like the zero and a 100 point scale, the use of the average, or confusing behavioral issues with academic issues, it will undermine everything else that you do. Come back for additional topics, and I'll be happy to remember to have your feedback at Douglas Reeves for Twitter, email douglas.reeves at creativeleadership.net. And if you want a conference call with your faculty, if you want a video conference, you can count on me to do that. Thanks for listening.